We're taking a trip back in time with a visit to the top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum in Nobinway. And we'll take a look at a UP tradition, pasties. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. On the northernmost shores of Lake Michigan is the town of Nobinway, and it's there you'll find the aptly named Top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum. If you want to see the history of snowmobiles, this is the place to do it. If you want to hear about the history of snowmobiles, Charlie Valier is the guy to explain it. We're located uh, 42 miles west of the Mackinac Bridge, right on US 2 in downtown Nobinway, the north side of the highway. We're open uh, seven days a week, nine to five. The only days we're closed, Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving. Other than that, we're open nine to five. Uh, if you're coming through at a different time, you can call our house number if we're around. Uh, we'll come down and open up for you. We like showing off what we have. And believe me, they have a lot to show off. Snowmobiles that most of us have never heard of. And some that date back to the beginning of snowmobiles altogether. Here we have a 1946 Eliason, 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 made in Saint, Center, Wisconsin. It comes with an Indian motorcycle engine, and he's been blessed with the first manufactured snowmobile. He actually built his first one in 1924. He was a trapper. He built one in his garage, and the next year he, his buddy wanted one, so he built another one. And in the late 30s, uh, the military wanted to buy 200. He couldn't produce 200, so he contracted with a four-wheel drive company to produce the first 200. So he's been blessed with the first manufactured snow sled. Bombardier, of course, was out there building the, what we know today in 59 as a sled that we know of today. Uh, these were made for work. This guy was a trapper. We have other ones over here that were made right here locally in the downtown Nobinway. It's a commercial fishing village, and uh, they used the rear engine ones for pulling their fish off the ice. They go five miles out in Lake Michigan. Um, two, three, four hundred pounds of fish, way to get them off the ice with the rear engine snowmobiles. And that's what they first started for was work. Commercial fishing, trapping utility companies, conservation officers, uh, loggers, farmers, uh, doctors used them to make house calls. This here's a Bozak power toboggan. It's got a GM transmission on it. The old what's called a three speed on the column. That's that GM transmission. It doesn't have a centrifugal clutch. It's just got two V belts with springs to pull the motor. So what you did, there was a locking device here. You push this forward, you locked it. Now the belts are loose. You could start it, shift it into gear. Right there's a transmission lever. Shift it into gear, let go of the belts, and the springs pull it tight, and away you go. That's really a unique piece. There's, this was the only one around for a long time, and now there's probably five or six in the United States now. This here is a 1959 Snow Traveler. It was the second sled on Lime Island. Lime Island is an island out here in the St. Mary's Shipping Channel. It was called a refueling station that would haul groceries back and forth, their mail in the wintertime. This is how they got their stuff back and forth to the island. Right next to the players, we have what's called a Polar. 1962, it was called Polar. 1963, they changed the name to Articat. Uh, and they only made like 30 some that first year that were called Polar, and this is number seven. So you could really say it was a seventh Articat made, but the first year it was called Polar. 62 Polar, 63 became Articat. Here's a Trailmaker made in Hibbing, Minnesota. It was called a Trailmaker in 1964, and it came with a snowplow was a, a, attachment. The wheels were another attachment, and the ice auger in the back was another attachment. So you could have all these attachments on this Trailmaker. I've seen it work. It plows snow. It also drills holes in the ice. I've seen it work. 906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by the Island Resort and Casino. Experience the excitement this football season. Be where the action is. Bet America Sportsbook at Island Resort and Casino. Visit T. McSee Sports Bar to browse the latest lines and betting options. Or build a bet on your time using Bet Builder Online. Find everything you need to know on the Sportsbook page at islandresortandcasino.com. So grab your friends and get in on the action, because there's a new game in town. Bet America Sportsbook at Island Resort and Casino. Okay, here we have a 1936, it's called Westendorf. It was made in Bay City. The guy's name was Westendorf, that's why they call it that. 
and he worked for the Wicks Machine Company out of Bay City, and he wanted to get further out into Saginaw Bay fishing. fishing. He was an ice fisherman. So what he did, he came up with this um, one and a half horse Briggs and Stratton engine. You pull this little lever here, and that tightens up the belt. You straddle the machine uh, with these pegs pulled out. The pegs were made to push them in, they'd fit in his Model T. You pull them out each side, you straddle it, you put your foot on here, and that pushed that down, and it pushed this wheel down in the back with a chain on it, and that would propel you on the ice. This still actually still runs. This is where he put his fishing gear, his starter rope, fishing gear went in here, and away you'd go. We have a 1970 snow bug made in Sudbury, Ontario. This was wide, you could set side by side in it, so it was called a love bug. But the, the more common one was a narrow version. There's quite a few of those around the UP that could, they would float on the snow. They were real great for hill climbing. The white thing here is the 1967 Stanaback, and Stanaback was a guy named Ken Stanaback out of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. He made two machines. This is the only one that's left. Two or three years ago, he was actually taking that out at our annual show we do in February. Tracks are getting bad on it, so now it's in a very good home setting right here. This is a, a 1926 Model T with a track conversion kit on it. You can see the tracks, you can see the skis. This kit was made in New Hampshire and it was actually called a snowmobile kit. And right here on a ski, it actually says Snowmobile Manufacturing Company, Ostapi, New Hampshire. They were the first ones to make a track conversion kit. They would make it, they would send it to the dealers, the dealers would put them on and sell them like that. This here is the Boss Cat. It's called Boss Cat 3. Artie Cat made it for uh, drag sleds. Everybody wanted to set a speed record. It's got four Kawasaki motors on it, hard to control. It actually flipped and burnt on one of their races, uh, but of course it's been restored since then. This is uh, a 1956 Tucker Snow Kitten. They only made 210 of these. Tucker is still being made today. Tucker is what grooms our snowmobile trails today, but this is the same company, um, of course, the new Tuckers are a whole lot different than this. This is mine, it runs great. Hard riding on hard packed snow, but you get in a fluffy snow, it's a quiet, nice running machine. Tucker Snow Kitten. This is a 1970 Timberwolf. It was made in Sioux, Michigan. It only made eight machines. We know of two that are left. This one and one in my garage that was a race prototype. It's been restored, but it actually has the original seat upholstery is from when it was brand new. It's kind of brittle. We restored it, and two years ago, we led the vintage lap around the Sioux Y500 track with this sled. It's really a unique-looking sled, and, uh, and it runs. This here's a snow coop. The Intivar company bought 200 Polaris Voyager chassis, and they put this top on it, and they called it uh, snow coop. Um, so it's all Polaris underneath. The top is called snow coop, and it's a two-seater again. You open the door, slide the door, Pull it open, jump in, like I literally jump in, close the hatch, start it, and away you go, and guess where the exhaust goes. I can still smell exhaust in it. Uh, the guy that owns this has had it out on the trail, and he said it's a good place for it right in here now. The tractor people, of course, they tried to get into it, like we said, the Tucker Snow Kitten. Well, this is a Massey Ferguson Ski Whiz. Yes, the Massey Ferguson Tractor Company built snowmobiles. This is a 72. They built them for a while themselves. And then in the later years, Scorpion built them for Massey Ferguson. They look like a Scorpion, painted the Massey Ferguson's colors, but still called the Massey Ferguson. Mallard, 1968 Mallard, and that's the Mallard Coach Company. They made um, rare sled also. It's kind of, that's all original. Next to it is the Montgomery Wards. Yep, you could buy it out of the catalog. Made by Player, sold by Montgomery Wards, called the Snow Go. This sled here is a, a 1972 Sabre, same thing as a Northway, but this is kind of unique. It's got this gizmo here on it. It's a cable fastened to the bumper. It comes up here and it's got a sharp edge here. This was designed to catch a fence. If you're out driving farmer's fields like a lot of people did, catch the wire here, come up here and cut it here. Okay, this here is a 1970s some Larvin. And you see the snow skis here? Well, you strap those to your feet put the bindings on your feet. That's how you turned it, is you leaned it, throw your skis out, you know, back and forth, that's how you turned it. Handlebar strictly to uh, hang on to, it doesn't turn, it's all solid, you had to lean with it, and that's what the skis were for. I'm just curious how many skis got run over and how many feet got sucked up under the track. Uh, made in Sweden, they made them quite a few years, clear into the 80s, I believe. Here we have what's, uh, 
It's called a Carefree. It was made in Charlotte, Michigan. They uh, also made a regular pull-behind sleigh that you could put kids in or whatever, but they also made this was a pop-up camper. This all folds inside of itself, just like a pop-up camper you pull behind a car and you pull it behind a snow sled. This was the deluxe model because it had the fishing hole in it. Well built, it's heavy. You had to have a pretty good sled to pull it. No luck with a buck? No Venny in the freezer? Not to worry. That doesn't mean you can't still have your own great tasting salami for the next game. Or snack sticks for the next ice fishing adventure. Head to your local grocery store and pick up some ground beef. Mix it up. Cook it up and, well, eat it up. Visit CookingWildSeasonings.com today to stock up on your supply of great tasting sausage and snack stick seasonings. This is a homemade air sled built in the 50s. It was made up in Minnesota somewhere. A lot of homemade air sleds in the Cedarville, this area here, because of all the islands out in the lakes, and they would chase coyotes around. Uh, but this was made in Minnesota to carry mail across, mail and groceries across the big lakes. A crazy loud. Scorpion actually manufactured about 50 air sleds. They were called trailer sled at first, and then after the trailer sled, which is a smaller air sled than this, it became Scorpion as we know Scorpion today. The air sleds were actually uh, produced in St. Ignis. It was called the Wing Aero Sled. Uh, they made them in the early 1900s in St. Ignis, and they would make them there or sell you a kit. On the Wing Aero Sled, we've talked to the grandson who is into his 70s now. He said in the early 1900s, they used them to go out to the islands chasing coyotes. Uh, and the Michigan had a bounty on a coyote, so they used these chasing the coyotes off the islands and anyway there was a bounty during the depression that was 30 bucks it was 30 bucks this here's a 1968 mercury yeah the mercury that made outboard motors same mercury but they also made chainsaws and the reason the chain two-man chainsaws here is that's what mercury put in their very first snowmobile was that two-man chainsaw motor um, it was a proven motor in their chainsaw for years and years and years, but once they put it in a snowmobile, they didn't get enough air to it, so they would burn pistons. They only made 400 sleds that first year. In order to take the hood off, you got to take the headlight out. That undoes the gas cap. Then you take the skis off. Then you take four bolts along each side, four bolts across the front, and that whole hood slides out. But then in 69 and 70, they came out with the same black mercury, but they made the hood that would come off it. They redid the motor. They got more air into it. Then they went to the snow twisters in 73, 4, and 5, and they're a, still a sought-after sled today. They're still a hot, hot sled today, the twisters. Mercury won the Sioux Y500 in 1976. That was their last year. They were done with the snowmobiles. This is a 1974 Articat VIP. The only year they made it was 1974, and all Articats then were black, but this one was brown. You can see the brown, fancy, but it was called a VIP. It had a catamatic transmission in it, which was an automatic. Uh, here it says right on it, catamatic. This was the oil reservoir. This was the torque converter, no belt. Yamaha did it for two years, and they called it fluid drive. Raider and Honda were gonna team up. It didn't work out between the two companies. We have a Raider here with a Salisbury torque converter that Honda put in it. 1971, Big Boss, made in Ovid, Michigan. There was like nine of these sold. The guy that owns this has one more. We know of one more in a museum in um, New Jersey. And we know that two just went to Minnesota about a year ago. That's, that's all we know of what's left. So it's kind of unique. It's pretty green, um, Big Boss. Made in Ovid, Michigan. We like the stuff made in Michigan. We have a little sign on everything that's made in Michigan. Um, made in Michigan. Another one of the tractor companies was, this is a wheel horse. The wheel horse sold garden tractors. And that's what a lot of the companies were doing is they already had the dealership and the network out there dealerships for like John Deere and Massey Ferguson and Wheel Horse and Gilson, these tra lawn tractor people. So they tried to get into the snowmobile business, something to do in the winter time. Of course, they were only around a few years. It just didn't work out for them. And you can see the snow flight right next to it. It was snow flight for two years and then it became Wheel Horse. A different colors, but you can really see the similarities to it. 
This is a 1964 Fox Track Ice Cycle. Fox Track made rear engine sleds too. They were made in Wisconsin, but this was called the ice. You can see it's got three skis, and the only thing that drives it is this sprocket right here. That grabs the ice and pushes it along, strictly for the ice. And this is kind of a unique brake too. This just digs into the ice when you want to pull back on the lever and digs into the ice. Harley Davidson had to make a sled, and it was made by AMF. The Harley Davidson bike guys come in here and they see that AMF on it and they just walk back by it. But another unique part of the snowmobile history is the Harley Davidson. This here is a very unique, it was called the Way We Go. It was made in Trinary. The guy made five like this, at least five. There may have been more. We know of five. Ralph Weber was his name, lived in Trinary. The family still lives there. And you can see that he copied a Husky. The Husky was made in um, Canada, but you can see that Ralph Weber saw one of these Huskies and he decided to make his own. We got a grant from the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs to restore it at our annual swap meet in September. We had the unveiling of this. The family was here. Very unique part of the history for the UP. Made in Trinary. So Trinary isn't only known for its toast. They made five snow sleds too. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works. Rapid River Knife Works is the largest custom knife factory showroom in Michigan. The 10,000 square foot showroom is awesome. Hunting knives, pocket knives, and kitchen knives. Watch your custom knife being made and engraved. Free laser engraving with your personal message or company logo. Lifetime warranty on every knife and free sharpening. Plus, visit Rapid River Knife Works gift shop for Stormy Cromer and RRK gear. Bring the family and visit Rapid River Knife Works today. Here's a nice fishing tip from Bear at Bear's Nine Pines Resort on Lake Gogebic. I use a lot of these spring bobbers like this because they're real light indicators for light biting, whether you're pan fishing, bluegill fishing, perch fishing, whatever. When you put the spring bobber on your pole, you lay the steel onto the top of your rod tip like this. You can adjust it. You can put it out further if you want it more sensitive or you can move it back. And what we do is we wrap this with dental floss. I'm sure your wife wouldn't miss one of these old nail polish that she don't wear anymore. You can see how this is all painted red. I just take my nail polish and I give it a couple of coats with that and it waterproofs it, locks it down tight, won't never unravel on you. It's good for life. Of course it comes in your choice of colors. If you want ribs, do you try Memphis, Kansas City, or Texas? For pizza, is it New York or Chicago? Well, the jury's still out, I guess. But if you're looking for a pasty, it's pretty simple. You'd head straight for the Upper Peninsula. The pasty wasn't invented here, and you certainly can find it in other places. But probably no other area is so directly associated with this tasty crust-wrapped culinary immigrant. Today I'm in Crystal Falls, and I wasn't leaving town without a stop at Nylon's Foods to find out more about this portable piece of UP culture. Pasty started in, in, in Cornwall, England, and what, what the Cornish people are known for is mining. So they came over here and uh, immigrated over to the United States and uh, ended up in all the, the iron mines uh, in the UP and Wisconsin and Minnesota. So, so everywhere there was a Cornish person, they had pasties. And pretty soon the Finnishian and the Italian uh, started making their, their own version of, of pasties and that. There's actually more pasty shops in Sacramento, California than there is in the UP, just because the, the, of the gold mining out there. When the, when the gold miners went out there, well, they were also Cornish, and they took the pasties with them. We started, actually my father started making pasties in, in the 60s. He started, he owned a grocery store, a little grocery store up in Republic, Michigan. Uh, great, great mining town, and any great mining town is, is, is pasties. Uh, some real nice Finnish ladies up there taught them how to make pasties. And, and so wherever we've been in the grocery business, we've, we've carried this forward with us. So we uh, decided to jump into the pasty business. And, and we've been in that 14 years from now. We, uh, we're uh, supplying, uh, I think right now, we're, we're into seven states. Pretty much the Midwest and that, where which uh, Michigan and Wisconsin are our biggest uh, customers in that. So this is our potato peeler, and our potato peeler we peel on the average day. We'll, we'll run 1,500 pounds of potatoes through here. We buy all our potatoes locally. They're uh, they're uh, 
Uh, Russ at Burbank. Uh, we buy them from uh, Johnson's out here, uh, out in Mansfield here, close to Crystal Falls. They are right now currently, I think he told me he's growing uh, between 30 and 40 acres of, of uh, potatoes for us. We peel the potatoes in this peeler. It basically uh, flops the, the potatoes around and there's an abrasive in here and it rubs it against the wall. As it spins, it, it takes a piece of the peeling off at a time. From the peeler, we run it into this commercial dicer here. This, this dices our potatoes. It'll, it'll dice probably up to 100 pounds a minute. From that process, we will go over to our, uh, to our mixer. We add potatoes, we add onions, we add carrots, we add the, the special seven secret spices. Add the beef to it, it's a USDA choice beef, and we'll, we'll, we'll run it out. This is, our, this is our, our, uh, our dough mixer here. We add flour and shortening and water and, and salt basically, and, and mix it and, and make pasty crust like anybody else, but we make 500 pounds at a time. From there, the, the dough is ran into a dough divider. It cuts the dough into hockey puck sizes. This will cut 120 pieces of dough a minute. From that, it'll, it'll be put on baking pans and stacked. From there, we run it up to our, the head of our, our production line here. We put the pieces of dough on this uh, double pass dough divider here and roll it out flat. And from there, it comes down a series of conveyors to the main conveyors. And from there, the guy that's uh, scooping the mix puts the uh, scoop of mix onto the pasty. At one time, we were automated where we had an automatic machine with, with electric eyes to do this process. Actually, the machine couldn't think enough, where it was better to put an actual person here that could sense if our mix was a little too wet or a little too dry because potatoes and onions and beef are not always the same. More moisture, less moisture, so this, this was a very important part to have a thinking machine. And that would be a human. So it runs down here, down the, down the assembly line to my, a series of pasty makers. We make uh, two, six, eight, and 12, and 16 ounce pasties. So they'll, they'll be making various different sizes. From there, they'll, they'll put the pasty back on the conveyor. Conveyor comes back down to a panner. The panner puts the pasties on a pan, puts the pasty pans on a rack. And from that point forward, the, the racks go into a rotating rack oven. And the rotating rack ovens, so we, we have two of them. We have a capacity to, uh, to cook uh, a thousand pasties every half hour. So if we want to, we can cook 2,000 pasties per hour. We cook them to uh, 168 degrees. And what we do, we, we cook all the meat in the pasty to make sure it's a sterile product. Pasty is probably one of your, from a food safety perspective, probably one of the safest products out there because we, we cook it and then we tell the consumer to cook it again. From the oven, we, we, we take them out there. We have, a, we have a series of cooling steps. We use filtered outside ambient air. So the colder it is, the, the happier we are outside. So I think it's, uh, oh, it must be 25 below out there today. And, and we're, we're real happy about that.